Do you want to know the lore behind the five casters featured on the Seance theme decks? Welcome back to Cryptid Theory. Tormentic here, and I am very excited today to be going over the five casters that are featured on the Seance theme decks. Uh, just to go over briefly, we have St. Germain, M, the Rainbow Wizard, Morgana, and Love. Now, I will start out this video saying that I believe that all five of them are actually evergreen casters, or at least they are at the level of an evergreen caster power-wise. Uh, we already know that the Rainbow Wizard, also known as Cassius Kane, is an evergreen caster. Um, it is assumed that Love is just because of the amount of power Love has, all of the tomes and spellbooks he has inside of his castle. Rainbow Wizard actually says that M trains him. We don't really know that much about Morgana or Saint Germain, but I want to say, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and actually say that these guys are at an evergreen caster level. So, let's jump right in and uh, let's explore these five casters that are featured as the theme decks for Seance. Now some of this you actually might already know because of the comics, but I'm going to go over it anyways. The first one we're going to talk about is Love. Now Love is normally known as Loveland Frogman. Uh, Love is just his actual name. He lives in Loveland, Ohio inside of his castle, which is very heavily warded. It also contains a vast majority of spell books and tomes and magical enchantments like this is a very interesting place inside of love's castle i also like i was saying before i feel he is an evergreen uh, just because of the abilities that he actually has the, the amount of of aura if you will that love actually has um, there's other stuff going into that as well that i'm going to touch on at a, at a later point uh, but i believe that love is actually like i was saying at an evergreen level the interesting thing about love is that he hints at one point of him being human and that he was cursed or enchanted. That's one of the reasons why he looks like a frog. Now, there's no specified time or anything like that of when this curse actually would have been put onto him. Uh, because of the curse, though, he cannot attack beasties. He can, in theory, still attack other casters, but if it is a cryptid or some sort of a beastie, he cannot attack it, that is part of the curse. Now, Love was first seen in 1955 in Loveland, Ohio. Uh, I believe it's my theory that he actually stayed in that area because it's not that far away from Point Pleasant in order to monitor the veil. Uh, we know that Point Pleasant was a weak spot in the veil, so it could possibly be all the way up to Loveland, Ohio. It could just be a vast area where that weakness of the veil existed. So Love picked that spot in order to pick a residence to monitor the entire veil that was actually there. It's also worth noting that uh, Love is the one that teaches Sam, in essence, how to cast. Um, it is very brief. Uh, they have to go over it pretty quickly just because of Orange Eyes attacking Loveland Castle. But Love is the one that teaches Sam how to actually cast, which is interesting. Now, the next one of these casters I'm going to talk about is Saint Germain. Now, I could not find anything about Germain using the E that is on the end of, of the name, the way that Metazoo spells it. But I did find something interesting, and I think it actually fits with why there's the extra letter at the end of the name. See, Saint Germain first is recorded in the 1700s as Comte de Saint Germain, who lived in France and entertained the royal French court. Now, he knew six languages, he could play the piano and the violin, he was very wealthy beyond reasoning. Um, no one really knows where he came from. He claimed to be the son of Francis II Rakosi, the Prince of Transylvania, but there's no actual official record of where he came from. Now, he did die in 1784. The interesting thing is, though, is that his death has always been mysterious because he was a very powerful alchemist in real life lore. Um, there's thoughts that he could have potentially created the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, he w was thought to have been able to potentially transmute metals. Like, he was a very serious, devout alchemist while he was alive. The interesting thing is, though, is that there is someone in the early 20th century that shows up in New Orleans. Uh, by the name of Jacques Saint Germain. A very young person, wealthy beyond measure, throws lavish parties, tons of food, invites everyone that he can to come over. But the thing is, is that he actually never eats anything. 
One night, though, after he had entertained his guests, he was at his house and he tried to bite a woman. The woman was able to escape. She actually fell off of a balcony. She ran to the police. By the time the police were able to come back to the house, Jacques was already gone, but they found bottles of wine that had human blood in them. So it is my theory that Saint Germain is Comte de Saint Germain and Jacques Saint Germain. He somehow was a very powerful caster or an alchemist from well before the 1700s, I believe. This is probably just the first time that he was ever recorded. But he was a very accomplished alchemist and caster, in my opinion, that has survived centuries. At some point, he either was turned into a vampire or because of the relation that he has to Transylvania, Transylvania potentially maybe Vlad the Impaler, that's where we get the vampire lore, that's where we get Dracula lore from. Potentially there was something with the blood that actually caused him to turn into a vampire. Maybe he wasn't actually bitten and turned into a vampire, but sometime at least between the 1700s and the early 20th century, Saint Germain tur basically turned more into a vampire, I believe. But again, he is a very accomplished alchemist. He is a very accomplished caster. I do believe he has he is at the evergreen caster just because of the level, just because of the longevity he's actually had. And the interesting thing is, is that because of him coming to New Orleans in the early 20th, 20th century, that gives him some sort of basis in North American lore. Because you can actually look up the vampire of New Orleans, and you will actually find Jacques Saint Germain because they found those bottles of blood. Now the next one I want to talk about, we know a little bit about of because of chapter 2. It's the Rainbow Wizard. His real name is Cassius Cain. Um, I'd like to say that he is the antagonist of chapter 2. Uh, he is definitely the one that tries to almost imprison Sam, if you will, in chapter 2. Won't let Sam leave to go find Adam and Rose. Uh, he is the headcaster of Quimbley's. Quimbley's is the premier casting school uh, located in Unity City, pretty much what is known as DC now. Um, it is like the top of the top of the top. Now, I was having trouble actually finding anything to do with his name Cassius Cain. Uh, the only things that really would pop up were for Cassius, like, even if you put Cassius Cain in together, they'll show up simultaneously. But for the Cassius side, it was in relation to the assassination of Caesar. And of course, on the Cain side, it was the killing of Abel. I think there's there, there's definitely something that I'm missing when it comes to the name Cassius Cain. He wouldn't have said it so early in the comics if there wasn't something there. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure exactly a lot of his backstory leading up for chapter two of the comic. Something interesting is that he actually does let it out to Sam that M is the one that trained him. Now we'll get to M here in just a second, but it's interesting to note just because the Rainbow Wizard is a known evergreen caster. He's one of the ones that Sam says that every child, I think under 10, can recite. The interesting thing is, though, is that M is not listed as an evergreen caster. So that would say that M potentially is stronger. I agree. I think that M is way stronger than Cassius Cain. But nobody really knows who M is. So that's interesting and worth pointing out. Cassius is also one of the evergreens that helped restore order and rebuild after the veil shattered because in the comic it talks about how a lot of things were destroyed, the spirit storms rose up, cities were decimated, and the evergreens were the ones that came in and actually helped restore order, put up veils, put up sigils, things of that nature in order to try to protect people. So Cassius did actually help rebuild once the veil shattered. The thing to me though is I don't fully trust the Rainbow Wizard because of the, his reaction when Sam was in his, in his court, I guess you could say, in the big library. And as soon as Sam started mentioning him, the Rainbow Wizard took an entirely different tone. And that's one of the reasons why I say that he's a little bit of an antagonist. It's interesting because M sent Rose and Adam to Quimbley's in order to train. They were sent, they were, they were labeled as prodigies, they were sent well before they were supposed to go to college. He didn't send Sam. As far as I'm aware, I don't think M really told the Rainbow Wizard that much about Sam whatsoever. So it was almost like M was trying to hide Sam from Cassius for some reason. The other thing that's actually very interesting 
is when Sam went to into Quimbley's, was talking to Cassius Kane, the Rainbow Wizard, he saw tons of different clones or younger versions of M working in the library, doing the bidding of the Rainbow Wizard. So clearly, the Rainbow Wizard has some sort of relationship with M, but we're not entirely sure exactly what that is or what, honestly, those clones or those younger versions of M were doing inside of Quimbley's. So the Rainbow Wizard is just one of those interesting characters where you don't really know what side of the fence he's actually playing for at the moment. Um, it is my theory that Cassius Kane, the Rainbow Wizard, is not a good guy. Um, I don't believe that he has the best of intentions. Sam even gets that feeling in the comic. Um, if you went and you actually watched the Key of Solomon video, you actually will know what I'm talking about when I say that the Seal of the Thief was actually on the spellbook, the M spellbook, the one that Sam was actually given from M. And when Cassius tried to cast on top of it, Sam could feel a huge amount of power being used trying to draw the secrets from that spellbook. The spellbook didn't give him anything and it was completely blank. And that was because of the Seal of the Thief, where that seal is from the Key of Solomon and it basically, if you put it on a, on a spellbook or an inscription, the words that are on that, the, the magical words, will not appear if somebody steals that spellbook or if they have bad intentions. And if you remember, when Love picks up the spellbook and looks at it, he can read it. So that tells me that Cassius Kane, the Rainbow Wizard, is someone that cannot be trusted because the spellbook itself won't allow Cassius to actually read it. And then eventually later on in, in chapter two, that's when the spellbook leaves all of the enchantments that Cassius has put around it and still ends up back in Sam's prison cell. So, like I said, my, my theory is, is that the Rainbow Wizard presents himself as some sort of good guy, leading the charge, helping humanity. But I honestly, in my heart of hearts, I really feel that he is somehow in cahoots with Indrid Cole. Now, M is probably one of my favorite characters in the entire storyline, and he's really only in the first chapter, but he has a huge story to tell. He's also probably one of the most mysterious characters in all of MetaZoo lore up to this point. A um, little bit of backstory with him, he shows up on the outskirts of Point Pleasant uh, a few days after the veil shattered, uh, happy as can be. Sam even says that M handled his powers developing very well, but in reality, I really feel that M was already a very accomplished caster, that that was just the magic infusing back into him, because I believe he has to be an evergreen caster. Like I said, he trained the Rainbow Wizard, so that means he's existed longer. I feel like he would have to have more power. Plus, some of the stuff that he actually does in the first comic is extremely interesting and, and powerful stuff. So he was probably happy because he actually got the full magic ability back that he had lost because of the veil being put there. I also feel though that M is one of the ones that actually helped put up the veil to begin with. Um, he, like I said, it, uh, he was a very powerful caster before the veil shattered. His spell book is described as a blood red color and it was, as uh, Sam says, it was always thick with spells and, and incantations and all things magical and arcane. That is worth also mentioning that one M at the end of chapter one pushes Sam through the doorway into the pathways. He, before he does that, he gives his spell book to Sam, which is very significant because it means that that power, those, the, that amount of spells, they're being passed on to Sam. So that's worth mentioning real quick. Sam actually says that M rarely takes out his spell book, meaning that he is able to cast by thought or words alone. He doesn't need the actual book. Uh, Sam says that one of the few times he actually ever took it out was when he was first putting up the veil around Point Pleasant. Now, M is also the one that raised Sam and Adam after the veil shattered. Um, it doesn't explicitly say when he quote unquote adopted them, um, and it doesn't, the comic doesn't also say that both of their parents passed away. But I would assume that at some point, a couple weeks after the veil shattered, M took them in. M started taking care of them and started raising them. Sam even basically starts calling him his father, especially when he's talking to Cassius Kane inside of Quimbley's. So he, that's, I want, that's interesting that out of everyone in the world, 
At that moment, this evergreen caster picked these two kids, literally, to help raise. Im also sent Adam and Rose both off to Quimbley's in order to be trained to, uh, to be a more powerful and proficient casters. It's worth noting that he never did force Sam to learn how to cast either. He always left it up to Sam, which is interesting because you would think that he would want Sam to learn how to cast, he would want Sam to be able to defend himself, but at no time ever have I ever gotten the impression that M ever forced anything upon any of the three of those, them kids. I'm not entirely sure why, too, he's not listed as an evergreen caster because of him uh, training the Rainbow Wizard, Cassius Kane. I'm not sure why he didn't want that pop, uh, knowledge to be public, but he is not a known evergreen caster. Now, M supposedly sacrificed himself at the end of chapter one uh, by pushing Sam through the doorway into the pathways in order to protect him. So M was there to act basically stop Mothman from trying to get Sam. And in essence, M blew up Point Pleasant for the second and the final time, sacrificing himself trying to save Sam. Now I know it seems obvious, but it's my theory that M is actually Merlin, master of alchemy and magic during King Arthur's time. Uh, he existed on the human side of the veil while the veil was put in place. Like I said, I believe he is actually one of the ones that helped put the veil in place to begin with and he still had some use of his magic. Now, all of the Arthurian lore would have taken place before the veil was actually put up, so it fits, in my opinion, that this very powerful caster Merlin and the veil being put in place, and for some reason Merlin or M still wandering around trying to protect or to conceal something. Now, there is a very interesting connection, I think, between Sam and M, but I'm not gonna get into that in this video just because I'm trying to focus on these casters, but I'll, I'll release that out here in a bit. Um, I think this goes well more into Arthurian lore than at first glance. Like, I think there's a lot more to this and Arthurian lore, which I'll, like I said, I'll get into later. Im looks to be alive during Seance. Um, I don't know why they actually would have a theme deck for him if he was not. I also know that Seance is supposed to be the veil, if you will, between life and death. Um, I've talked about how I thought that they were trying maybe to bring Im back from the dead. This could be that M bringing him back like I said from the dead or to be honest with you now that we know that Hero is an evergreen caster he can time travel this M could be a different M it could be a M from a previous time or anything like, the time travel aspect of Hero is is huge because it brings up a lot of implications into MetaZoo lore because if one evergreen can do it then there's nothing stopping any of the other evergreen class casters from being able to do the same thing. Now the last one I want to talk about is Morgana, especially going off from Merlin, because it is my belief that Morgana is actually Morgan Le Fay, the Queen of Avalon, also known as the Queen of the Fairies. Uh, she was a very powerful witch slash enchantress in Arthurian lore in the 6th century. She was actually trained by Merlin himself, um, in some instances, in earlier instances, she's looked at as being a healer. In later instances, she's actually looked at as being someone literally trying to dethrone Arthur and destroy his Knights of the Round Table. Very interesting um, that Morgana, Morgan Le Fay have lots of different names, lots of different spellings. Um, and this one actually fit almost perfectly with it. Now, after the Battle of Camelon, Morgana takes King Arthur to the Isle of Avalon in order to try to heal him to save his life. Now, he, he eventually does die on the Isle of Avalon. Uh, it's interesting that they take him to the Isle of Avalon also. It's theorized that the Isle of Avalon is off of the British coast, uh, but it's also noted that you had to take a boat to it and it was a decent trip. Now. This might be a little bit of a stretch, but for some reason, I decided I was going to die. I looked up Salem proper, like what is the city limits of Salem, Massachusetts. And it just so happens that out in the, in the water, there's an island. It's called the Plum Island. And I'm theorizing that Plum Island could actually be the Isle of Avalon. Now, you might ask, well, wait a minute. What are you talking about? They have to cross the ocean in order to get to it. Of course. But this is pre veil so this means that they have a lot more magic available to them that we don't understand now. Pretty much I'm talking about the pathways. The same thing that M pushed Sam into. 
they could have used the pathways in order to cut the travel time in half in order to get across the ocean over to the Isle of Avalon. For all we know, it could literally have taken them maybe a day to actually get from the British Isles to the Isle of Avalon. Now, you also have to think too that nobody in that time in the 6th century even knew about North America. So it would make sense that it would be an island of the, uh, a land of the gods or a land of magic because it would be so far away, nobody would recognize anything that has anything to do with that side of the world. It's also worth noting that if the Isle, uh, Plum Island is the Isle of Avalon, it makes sense that actually gives Morgana or Morgan the Fey a, a base of operations in North America, aka Cryptid Nation. Now saying that, I don't think she is actually a good character. Um, I think that she is definitely going to be one of the antagonists, um, especially with her opposition to Merlin. One of the other things that actually made me start thinking about Morgana being Morgan Le Fay was the tarot card that they shared, was the Queen of Wands. And I know things are intentional, and so it made me think of Morgana because, or, and Morgan Le Fay because of her being the Queen of Avalon and the Queen of the Fairies, because there's a lot of lore saying that she is actually of the Fay uh, familiarity. Now, to sum everything up briefly, I want to say that Saint Germain is actually Comte de Saint Germain from France that then moved to North America, became Jacques Saint Germain, the vampire in essence, and was forced out of New Orleans. I want to say that Morgana is Morgan Le Fay from Arthurian lore, and that she actually resides on the Isle of Avalon, which is actually Plum Island in Salem, Massachusetts proper. M is Merlin, and he is one probably one of the most powerful casters in MetaZoo. You also have Love, who is a cursed person, and the curse makes him look like a frog, and it also makes it to where he cannot attack any sort of beastie whatsoever. There is an interesting connection, I believe, between Love and M, which I'll get into at a later point as well. And then you have Cassius Cain, the Rainbow Wizard, who makes it look like he's doing everything for the best intentions of everybody, but I can't tell you enough how badly I get Saruman uh, vibes from him. like. The Rainbow Wizard, Cassius Kane, is someone who I don't believe we can trust. Thank you so much for letting me take the time to sh explain who these five casters featured on the Seance theme decks are. And let me know if you have any questions down below, let me know if you have any ideas, or if you think uh, you have another idea of who they actually are, and I might be wrong. But my name is Tremantic, and I hope you have a great day, casters.